Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis uh, by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. In addition, you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. And I want to thank our latest Patreon supporter, George, for coming on board at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for the support, George. Now let's go ahead and get into this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. The original air date, May the 13th, 1951, and the title is Paid in Full. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, paid in full. It is 7.45 p.m. August 18th, 1941. Nick Hubbard, a West Texas farmer, is seated at the dinner table with his wife, Min. But Hubbard is not eating. Instead, his attention is riveted on an advertisement in the newspaper before him. Will you stop staring at that thing and eat your supper, Nick? I ain't hungry. You've had your nose buried in them new car ads ever since you got the check for the cotton crop. That lot of good it's doing you. We can't buy one. We couldn't if I didn't have to pay that Mexican for working on shares. You could have made the crop yourself if you wasn't so lazy. You want to shut up or do I have to fetch you a punch in the mouth? I didn't mean nothing, Nick. Now shut your trap and keep it shut. $1,100 for my cotton, and I've got to give half of it to that Mexican. Ain't nothing you can do about it, Nick. Don't you go telling me what I can do. Doc took him and his family in, didn't I? Fed them, let them live on a shack on my land. Seems to me that's enough for any man to do for him, eh? Worse than salt. Morales didn't chop enough cotton to make into a nightshirt. How can you say that, Nick? You got $1,100 out of his crop. Even half of that's more than you made before doing the work yourself. Ah. He knows you got the check, Nick. Can't stall him much longer. It's been three days now, and he's coming back again tonight. Reckon that's him now, Nick. Come on right up on the front porch like you own the place. You're busy with your dishes. I'll handle him. Well, Morales, what you want? Uh, Senor Hubbard, I, I come for my money uh, for the cotton. I told you I'd bring it to you when it come. I ain't got it yet. I can't give you what I ain't got. Uh, please, Senor, por favor. I, I don't like to bother you, but... My wife, she's sick. We, we're going to have another baby. Look, I got troubles of my own, Morales. Senor Hubbard, I know you got the money. I asked the cotton buyer. He tell me that everybody is paid. You checking up on me, you stinking wetback. I am not a wetback, senor. I do not sneak across the border. I am a good citizen of this country. Good citizen. <laughs> All right, come on in. Now, look. 
Tell you what I'll do, and it's better than you deserve. Yeah. Here's fifty dollars. We'll call it square, and you and your brute can get off my land by morning. No, senor. No. You don't give Jose Morales fifty dollars. I want my money, senor. All my money. You better pick that fifty up, Morales, because that's all you're gonna get. Senor, if you do not give me the money, tomorrow I go to a lawyer in the town. A lawyer? Oh, you got no good clothes, senor. Please, please let me go, senor. You're going to take that 50 and sign a paper right now. Please. Nick, what is it? You stay out of this, man. Me and Morales just made a deal. Yeah. Where's that pencil and some paper? In the second shelf. I do not sign any paper, senor. Come back here, Morales. I go to the law, senor. You ain't going far. Nick, no. No, not the shotgun. Let go of me. Nick, you're crazy. Get back. Come back here, you stinking wet back. No, no. All right, then. That brush ain't gonna cover you. Oh, Nick. Nick, what'd you do? Shut up, shut up, man. Nick. He's dead, Nick. What are you gonna do, Nick? Shut up, shut up. Shut up, let me think. Let me think. Uh, I gotta get him off the place. Help me lift him. I better get him off the place. I can't, Nick. I can't touch him. I... Uh, help me, I said. Keep your mouth shut. Forever from now on, keep your mouth shut. Or I'll shut it like I shut his. <laughs> The body of Jose Morales was discovered two days later by a field hand. It had been dumped in a thicket in rugged country near a path used as a shortcut to town. The sheriff was summoned, and he, in turn, asked for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Good thing you were towing your horse trailer, Jace. Be a rough go on foot. The path looks like it gets plenty of use, though. Yeah, field hands use it for a shortcut to town when they're walking or mounted. Guess they figure three miles of this is better than eight miles of highway. Uh, body's just up ahead. I rode down a ways to meet you when I heard your horse. You said something about somebody reporting Morales missing before the body was discovered. That's right. His wife came into my office yesterday and said he hadn't been home all night. Means he might have been killed the night before last. Uh, it seems that way. Oh, uh, here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, Charky. Uh, right in that thicket. Shotgun, huh? Yeah. Got it behind the head and threw his back. Heavy charge. 12 gauge, probably. He just like he was found? Yeah. He wasn't killed here, then. Not killed here. Why not? We're at the head of the body. That means he'd have been walking this way, through the thicket, when he was shot. And he'd fall forward on his face toward us. Mm, that's right. All right, now look at the thicket behind his feet. The direction he would have been coming from. Well, what about it? It hasn't been disturbed. He couldn't walk through that thicket without breaking some of it down. Besides... He wouldn't be walking off the path. Oh, I see what you mean. He must have been on the path when he was shot then. And never gunned him, carried the body over this way, and dumped him into the thicket. Have a look at that path around here. Well, blood from his wounds should have left a mark someplace, a stain on the ground. Yeah. yeah nothing here. No sign of blood, no sign of the earth being scuffed over to hide it. No. Well, we're not going to find anything. Not around here. He'd been dumped when that wound was fresh. We'd have found something by now. He was brought in here after all the bleeding had stopped because somebody didn't want the body found where he was killed. Well, that means we've got to find out where. It's not going to be easy. It never is. There's one good thing about it. Once we do find the place, it isn't going to be far from the killer or the body wouldn't have been moved. Well, there's nothing else for us to see here. Lab man's flying in from Austin. Might find something when the medical examiner does an autopsy. Uh, I'll have to stay here a while. Men who directed you here are bringing pack animals to take the body into town. Yeah, there's no sense in both of us staying. I'll get started. Hey, you know where Morales lived? Yeah, shack near the cotton fields on the north rim of Nick Hubbard's farm. Yeah. Thanks, Sheriff. Uh, don't suppose you know if Morales was having trouble with anybody? Uh, not that I know of, Jace. I reckon his family might know something, though. Or maybe the Hubbards. I'll see them both. Meet you in town when I'm finished. Okay, Jace. Get around, Chuck. Up, boy. Come on, let's go. I got back to my car, loaded charcoal into the horse trailer, and drove to the Hubbard farm. Hubbard wasn't there, but his wife was out back scrubbing clothes. 
She was trembling and kept wetting her lips as she spoke to me, and I could see that she'd been crying. Yes. We, we heard about it maybe an hour ago. Somebody called on the party line to tell my husband. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Hubbard? He, he drove out to the Morales shack to tell Mrs. Morales and see if maybe there wasn't something he could do for her and the kids. Well, Morales worked chairs for us, you know. And so the sheriff told me. I, I don't know what, what his woman will do now. How far is the shack Morales lived in? A little over a mile. Our place goes back quite a ways. Landing t- too good. We got a lot of it. Morales ever come here to your house, I mean? Only when he had some business with Nick, my husband. When was the last time? Don't rightly know, Ranger. Like I said, he'd come to see Nick. Well, he'd probably be around when he came, though. When was the last time you saw him? I can't say for sure. I'm too upset to think. Oh, there comes Nick now. There's his car coming across the field. Good. Maybe he'll know something. I'd like to know if Morales was here the night before last. Nick will know for sure. He'll tell you. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Oh, your car here as I was coming across. Mighty slick looking here. Puts my old bus to shame. Nick, the ranger wants to know some things about Morales. Well, I can figure that for myself, men. What else would he want to know about? Yeah, I just left his widow. This thing's hit her kind of hard. Go sure feel sorry for him and them kids. I know. Of course, men and me will do anything we can to help them. I told her they could stay out of the shack, men. And that we wasn't fixing to charge him no rent nor nothing. Poor woman. Now, men, hold down to yourself. Your wife can't help how she feels, Mr. Hubbard. There's just a couple of things I want to know. When did you see Morales last? Your wife couldn't remember. Yeah, you sure are broken up, men. You ought to remember Morales is here night before last. I, I wasn't sure, Nick. Night before last, huh? What time? Why, just after we finished supper, 8 o'clock, maybe. The same night he was killed. You mean he's been dead that long? Judging by the appearance of the body, yes. We'll know for sure when the medical examiner gets finished with him, but why are you so surprised? Well, I I mean, uh, he was only found a little while ago. He's been missing since the night before last, though. His wife reported that to the sheriff's office yesterday. You knew that, didn't you? Well, sure I knew it, but uh, I figured he was off on a toot, celebrating with that roll of money. What roll of money? Money I paid him for working shares on a cotton. Is that when you paid him? When he was here night before last? Sure, handed him $550. That's why I'm surprised men didn't remember him stopping by. Why, you remember, men, you was there when I handed him the cash and he made his X on that receipt I wrote out. I wasn't sure of the night. So he had $550 cash on him. Well, now I can see a reason for his being murdered. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's the matter? What? Something Mrs. Morales told me just a while ago when I was over there. About a field hand who dropped in the night Morales disappeared. He wanted to borrow some money. Waited around for him, but when he didn't come, the fella said he'd walk down toward my place here and see if he couldn't meet Morales on the way. She mentioned the field hand's name? Uh, can't remember. Uh, Shorty, I think. Shorty something. Anybody show up here that night looking for Morales? No, not while he was here, not after he left. Wasn't nobody, was there, man? No. Must have met Morales. Away from here then, Ranger. Hmm? Maybe the man you're after. Sure looks mighty possible, Hubbard. I'm going to see Mr. Morales and find out who that man was. You want to point out the way? Do better than that, Ranger. I'll ride out with you. Fine. Let's go. Goodbye, Miss Hubbard. Bye, man. Back later. Bye. Sure is a smooth car you got here, Ranger. I won't get me a new car soon. She sure do hum, don't she? Yeah. Am I heading right? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Straight across the field and follow that fence line. Sure is a shame about Morales. But uh, I reckon you ain't gonna have much work once this woman tells you who that fellow was, the shorty. Yeah, it looks like you had a motive, all right. Sounds like the killer to me. I hope you get him, Ranger. Morales is a mighty fine Mexican. Mighty fine. Ain't see anybody get away with killing them. Man, this is a fine car, ain't it? <laughs> Listen to her purr.
In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. But first, here is an important announcement. Next Sunday, over most of these same NBC stations, you will hear Tales of the Texas Rangers at a new and earlier time. Yes, beginning next Sunday, listen one hour and a half earlier for this program. This new earlier time will bring you Tales of the Texas Rangers immediately following the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show and right before Theater Guild on the Air. Remember, next Sunday, tune in one hour and a half earlier for Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae and tonight's case paid in full, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Marilla's shack was threadbare, but scrubbed clean like the two wide-eyed kids who clung to their mother's skirts. There was heartbreak in her eyes. She kept it smothered for the sake of her children till she sent them outside so we could talk. Go! Go! Play in the back. Papito, help Rosa find her dog. I... I try not to cry when they are near me. Uh, take it easy, Mrs. Morales. Easy? What is easy? Life is hard for me, for them... And now they have no father to help you. Now, now, everything's going to be all right. I, I told you you can stay on here rent-free and everything. We didn't want to stay here. We were going to move away and get a little place of our own for the new baby that's going to come. As soon as you gave us his money, why do you make him wait so long? Well, I... For three days, every day he asked you for his share. And you keep saying you don't get the check yet. But you did. What is this, Hubbard? Well, it's just a little misunderstanding, Ranger. I can explain it. I, I didn't want to give Jose the money. I wanted to give it to Mrs. Morales here. I asked him to bring her down to the house and collect it. Why? Why, for her sake and the sake of the kids. You know how some sharecroppers are. I might have taken all that dough and blown it in on a tequila bin. Jose would not spend our money that way. He was a good husband. Well, I got no way of being sure of that. I was just trying to look out for you and your youngsters. Is that a crime? No, but while you were being so considerate, you could have driven out here with the money instead of expecting this woman to walk to your place to get it. Mrs. Morales, Mr. Hubbard says you told him about somebody coming here to borrow money from your husband the night he didn't come home. See, a man who worked with us at some place once before, two years ago. They call him Shorty, Shorty Davis. You tell him your husband had gone down to Hubbard's place? See. Si. Then he said he would not wait anymore. He would walk down and try to meet Jose. Then he went away. That's all. You see, it's just like I told you, Ranger. Probably met Jose, talked him into going to town when he found out he had the money. Then he murdered him when he got him off on that shortcut trail. My poor husband. Now, don't you worry. They'll get that shorty fella. We haven't got him yet, Hubbard. A couple of things don't fit. Mrs. Morales, did Shorty Davis have a shotgun with him when he came by? No. Probably had the whole thing planned in advance, Ranger. Had the gun stashed away on the shortcut. It still doesn't add up. Hubbard. Why not? Because Morales wasn't killed on the shortcut. He was killed someplace else and taken out there. How do you know that? Because there'd be certain signs at the scene of the murder that weren't around where the body was found. You mean like blood on the ground? Things like that? Yeah, things like that. So, uh... Shorty must have killed him someplace else. Somebody did. We'll pick Shorty up and see what he's got to say. Goodbye, Miss Morales. Goodbye. Come on, Hubbard. I'll drive you home. When I got back to the sheriff's office, it was late afternoon, and the medical examiner and our lab man had finished. The sheriff had a complete report. Moving this speech to your approval. Oh, the report's right there on my desk, Jase, in that top folder. Thanks, Sheriff. You were very cool there. I'll sign it later, brother. Anything special in this lab report? Yeah, a few things. Here, yeah, let me show you. Look here. Shot followed a downward path, indicating that the gun was fired from above and behind the victim. Pattern of shot spread, a number of pellets striking target from normal number of pellets in regulation 12-gauge shell. Further indicates that shot came from approximately 20 yards behind victim with gun muzzle at high level. That's pretty interesting, isn't it, Jase? Plenty interesting. Means that Morales must have been shot by somebody who was standing on something above the ground level, or maybe somebody mounted. Uh, that's the way it shapes up. You know anything about a field hand named Shorty Davis? Yeah, I've been around here for quite some time. You know where to find him? 
doesn't leave any place regular, just grubs around. Could hurt in an accident before the cotton season and never had a chance to put any money by. I reckon he's mighty hard up. What do you want him? Tell you why we're looking. Let's find him. We combed the town until midnight, but there was no sign of Shorty Davis. I called my headquarters and with the sheriff supplying a description, put out a statewide pickup. It was just after dawn when it paid off. Shorty Davis was picked up by the highway patrol less than 50 miles away. They brought him back to us. All right, Shorty. Sit down over there. Mr. Sheriff, what for those men bring me back here? I ain't done nothing. If you haven't, you'll be taken back to where you were picked up. Meanwhile, where were you going? Just heading for El Paso to see my folks, Mr. Ranger. Kind of sudden decision, Shorty. You've been hanging around here for months. I couldn't go before, sir. I was waiting to get me some money. You mean you've got money now? Why, yes, sir. Where'd you get it, Shorty? What, what? From my accident. You remember the accident I had, sir, when Mr. Hoxie Wilson hit me with his automobile? Well, the lawyer man, Mr. Corby, he got me some settlement money for getting hit. Is that the truth, Shorty? Won't take long to find out if it isn't. I wouldn't lie to you at all, sir. You could ask Mr. Hoxie Wilson. You better call him and check, Sheriff. I sure will. I'll bring him in Hoxie Wilson's place. Yeah, Hoxie Wilson. Mr. Ranger... Where did the sheriff think I got the money? You'll find out later, Shorty. How much have you got? Well, uh, I had a hundred dollars. Just spent a couple for eating yesterday. Hello, Hoxie. When did you leave town? Yesterday morning. Fine, what time? Early, right after the bank opened, Mr. Hoxie got me the money. Then you didn't know that Jose Morales was found dead yesterday morning? Dead? Murdered. He was murdered the night you stopped by his shack to see him. I never did see him that night. But you did stop by the shack. Yes, sir, but he wasn't home. He, his wife tell you that, sir. His story about the money is okay, Jace. Sir, I ain't telling you no stories. I'm telling you the truth. Well, just keep on telling it. Go ahead, Jace. I've been listening with one ear. Mrs. Morales told you where her husband was, didn't she? She said he was at Hubbard Farm, that's all. And didn't you leave the shack saying you'd go down to the farm and meet him? Yes, sir. I wanted to get the lender some money from Jose. He knew me. We worked together once. He loaned me before, and I always paid him back. We ain't asking about your credit rating, Shorty. What we want to know is what happened after you met Morales. I never did meet him. Wasn't nobody at Mr. Hubbard's place. The Hubbards weren't there? No, sir. I knocked hard on the back door, and there wasn't nobody there at all. Now, you've been mighty sure of what you're saying, Shorty. I am sure, Mr. Sheriff. That old house was just plain empty. Jose wasn't there. I thought maybe he'd come back, or maybe he hadn't been there yet. So I went over in the field and sat me down on the stump and waited. Then Mr. Hubbard and his wife, they drove up real slow. Had a couple of horses hitched to the back of the car. Horses? Yes, sir. What kind of story are you trying to invent? I ain't inventing nothing, Mr. Sheriff. That's gospel. Didn't the Hubbard see you? No, sir. Like I said, I was in the field, sitting by a stump. Well, didn't you let him know you were there? No, sir. It was Morales I come to meet, and he wasn't with him. I didn't want Mr. Hubbard raising a fuss with me and asking me what I was doing around his property tonight. No, sir. That man, he mean. Jase. Hubbard wouldn't be towing horses around at night without a reason. The only reason I can think of is for packing something to a place he couldn't get to in his car. You mean like packing Morales' body up that shortcut trail? That's right. But why'd they kill him? Because Hubbard was lying about paying Morales his share in that cotton crop. He acted mighty funny when it came out he'd stalled about paying... Shorty? Yes, sir? I want you to repeat your story and we'll type it. Yes, sir. Take your statement. Statement? Yes. After that, Sheriff, we're going out and have a good look at Hubbard's farm. A darn good look. I... Oh, excuse me a minute. Hello? Speaking. How did that happen? I see. I'm not willing for whatever it calls. Sheriff, what's the matter? That was... Doc Barker, Mrs. Morales, come into the funeral parlor to see her husband. She fainted, fell. Jeez, she lost her baby. We headed for Hubbard's farm, but we parked off the road about a half mile away and cut across the fields on foot, hoping we could check around outside the house without being spotted. We were in the cover of some trees, and we saw Mrs. Hubbard come from the back of the house carrying a wash tub. What the devil is she doing with that wash tub, Jake? I don't know. Don't let her see you. Hey, 
She's dumping it by the brush. Yeah. Well, why didn't she dump it in back? I never saw a woman carry a laundry tub around to the front of the house to dump it. Or she was growing something. A lot more than one tub full has been dumped in that spot. Look at that ground. It's soaked. Come on. Going to the see us? I want to find out what she's doing. Hubbard isn't around. The garage shed is open and the car isn't there. Just a minute, oh. Miss Hubbard. Oh, it's you, Ranger. And the sheriff. It's a funny place you picked to empty a laundry tub, ma'am. Well, I... The ground seemed kind of dry. It's dry all around here, except for this one spot by the brush. Quite a lot of water's been dumped here. Much more than you had in that tub. Take a look around, Sheriff. Well, what are you looking for? Maybe a couple of blood stains dried into the ground. Now, if there was anything here, Jace, we're too late now. Mud's an inch thick. Clear to the base of this brush. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There's one thing that's still here. Take a look, Sheriff. What is it? The leaves on this brush. Holes ripped through some of the leaves, just the way they'd be if a shotgun charge came through. They've been some, some bugs. Bugs never made these holes, ma'am. Sheriff, look at the porch of the house. How far away did you say it was? Well, maybe 18, 20 yards. What makes... Hey, the lab report said the shot was fired from approximately 20 yards. With a muzzle level above the victim, and that porch is the only elevated spot it could have come from. Hubbard must have fired from there. That ain't so. Nick didn't kill Morales. He didn't. He did, and you know it. When I asked you when you'd seen Morales last, you kept stalling your answer until your husband came. He's committed two murders if the truth is known, men. Because Mrs. Morales just lost the baby she was carrying. Oh, no, no. Nick is your husband, men, but lying for somebody like him ain't right before earth or heaven. You know it. I told him not to do it. I begged him to pay Morales, but he was greedy, greedy. He... He took a shotgun and... Where is the gun, ma'am? In the house. I'll show you. I can't go on with this no more. All last night, he was dumping water out there by the brush where Morales fell. Something you said yesterday about blood stains scared him. It scared me, too. That's why I brought the laundry water out there. I couldn't stop thinking about it. There's the gun. There in the corner. Maybe I ain't a fit wife. Maybe I shouldn't have told you, but I feel better about it now. I feel better. Tonight, maybe I'll sleep again if I live to be old enough. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Hubbard? I don't know. He left this morning before sunup to drive to Center City. Said he'd be back before noon. I guess we'll just sit and wait then, if you don't mind. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Car coming up the drive now. Take a look out through those curtains. That ain't Nick's car. Well, that, that one's brand spanking new. That's Nick in it, though. So that's what he went to Center City for. She's right, Sheriff. That man really yeah, loves new cars. Here, yeah, stand back from the window. Let him come in. Hey, man! Come give your eyes a treat. I... Howdy, Hubbard. Yeah. Uh, howdy, Sheriff. Ranger. In. Why are you looking at me like that? I told him, Nick. I told him everything. I told him how you cheated Morales, how you shot him in the back. Shut up! Shut your crazy mouth! No, you don't. Don't try that again. Now get up. Mrs. Morales lost her baby, Nick. Ain't you proud of that? While you was buying your new car, she was losing her baby. Don't, Ben. Don't say any more. Please, Ben. You got a new car, didn't you, Nick? <laughs> you know where you're going to drive in it, don't you, Nick? You know where. Take care of her, Sheriff. I'll take him. All right, jeez. Come on, Nick. Let's go. At his trial, Nick Hubbard broke down and confessed to the murder of Jose Morales. He was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of his life. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers.
Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Whitfield Connor, Ed Begley, and Jester Hairston. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Remember, next Sunday over most of these same NBC stations, listen one hour and a half earlier for Tales of the Texas Rangers. NBC. N- Enjoy the very best in radio. B- Be sure that you dial and write. T- Seems like the very best in radio. Morning, noon, and night is from this station. Morning, noon, and night, NBC. Bill Baker invites you to join the $64 question next on NBC. Welcome back. It's a bit ironic that the man the murderer wanted the law to track down ultimately provided the evidence that uh, pushed the law uh, in his direction. Although I don't think the wife would have held out much longer, though it could have also been a challenge for her to find a safe time and place to be able to tell what she knows without uh, the ranger coming to her door. And this is yet another story featuring the idea of uh, trying to cheat a sharecropper. In others, it was less that the actual person who owed the money wanted to cheat them than it was that some relatives wanted them cheated and thought the money should go to them. But here it's the actual owner of the land. It does make me wonder to what extent delays in payment were a real hardship or pervasive uh, problem with uh, sharecroppers. Very curious about the history from this episode because It's one thing to not make much money, to be in a profession where, you know, it doesn't pay much. It's another thing to be in a profession that doesn't pay much and to be dealing with people who sometimes just decide they'd rather not pay you. So definitely some serious hardship. Listener comments and feedback now. And we have a couple of comments from YouTube. First from Scott and Deborah. Who uh, writes, I hear folks say how violent we've become. It ain't nothing new. Uh, it's just pushed 24 7. But mankind has always committed heinous crimes. Sure, this is entertainment, but it's still there in history. Well, thanks so much for the comment. And, and I, I think that uh, there's definitely something to uh, what uh, Scott and Deborah are saying. Uh, because we have to be careful not to idealize the past and pretend there was a time when everything was perfect. And if we could just hit the reverse and go back there and we'll find everything's fine. But the truth is more complex. I think things are getting better and getting worse, both at the same time. Better in some ways, worse in others. And it also doesn't mean if we can find that there were problems in the past that there aren't problems in the present. We may find different types of crime or types of crime that have increased and you have to find ways to address that. And actually understanding history, I think, can definitely be helpful in that regard. And then we also have a comment on YouTube who writes, for those who don't know, the numbers racket is uh, today what we call the lottery. Back in the day, one of the ways you could uh, gamble was to bet on how certain stock numbers would end the day at the closing bell at 4 p.m. Once uh, blue laws were deemed unconstitutional, several states instituted state lotteries. This is what killed the numbers racket. That's an interesting point, and I have to admit I found myself thinking about that when listening to various radio programs that describe the 
uh, dangers of uh, playing the numbers. All right, well, now let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Robert, Patreon supporter since August 2020, currently supporting the program at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Robert. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. Uh, but be sure and join us on Monday for Sam Spade, where... What can I do on you? What do you know about Major Andrei Vrodnik? Ha! Huh? Andrei Vrodnik! On him we have hate, great sadness, with shame for the ground that walked under him. Oh? Ha! Andrei Vrodnik! Uh, why is he so popular? On the devil he is driven without horns. Six women he has killed. Six times he has insulted the police of Europe by refusing to confess. We have proof of the murders, but never can we prove the proof on him. Yeah, sometimes it goes that way. Ha! Never do we find the bodies of the six women. Only their money in the name of Andrea Vrodnik. My pardon. Well, think nothing of it. You're, uh, you're just upset on, on you. You're interested on him. Why? You go to Europe? No, uh, Rodnick comes here. Ah, here? Here on San Francisco? He marries again? So I'm told. Ah! Oh, by all the means, you must prevent it. Go to him, brave man. You do the world a service. Make violence on him. Even do you hang for it, your name will live. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>